Okay. The clock uses many gears of various sizes. as you try to trace the potential motion from the drum to the clock face, but it's too complicated. You hear four distinct bongs of the clock tower's bell. Alright. I think now... There we go. This is a room of learning. A few books and papers are scattered on across every surface, but there's room for much more. Alright, let's read the book. I record these notes in no particular order, with no particular format. Should this text be read by others than myself, I can but I can but apologize in advance. My name is Balthazar, and I am the king's personal necromancer. My duties include raising and maintaining the royal servants, through though my deeper interests lie in the pursuit of others of other oh, of other lost magical arts. The following notes comprise the research of a lifetime of research into these arts, as well as my personal musings on these and other matters. Necromancy. I've never considered the practice of necromancy to be on strong moral ground. We have established that, in order to survive in this harsh world, the dead are required to serve the living. Their labor supports our existence, but do we truly know what we're doing? What exactly are we bringing back? And how do our tamperings affect the rest of the wave? The dead never appear especially unhappy, merely confused in their own unfathomable minds they exist in a time previous to their deaths. They perform the duties which they performed in life. In fact, it's almost impossible to teach the dead anything new. Their capacity to focus on unfamiliar tasks is minimal. A corpse can be given new orders, but in due course, depending on the nature of the particular specimen, it will inevitably revert to modes of behavior it demonstrated in life. There's no harm done when the tasks that the specimen performed in life have some application after death, but sometimes those tasks have little or no worth in, it, worth in our world, and yet the corpse, living mentally in its former reality, cannot be persuaded to abandon its behavior. Occasionally, the behavior can be modified to one of, its, of one of useful purpose, but more often all we can do is ignore the corpse, which strikes me as a regrettable waste of manpower. Nevertheless, even this densest corpse can be used for menial tasks, and this becomes their primary value. Corpses can be made to perform functions which the living cannot or would not perform. I can't recall a time when battles were waged by living soldiers. Why trouble ourselves when we have available so many who have already fallen? Their insensitivity to pain allows them to sustain blows that would cripple a living soldier. The dead don't stop until they can no longer move. In addition to war, corpses can be induced, induct, induced to undertake all potentially harmful tasks, such as fending off attacks from would-be predators. Claws and poison stings are fearful only to those who are aware of the consequences. Personally, I feel that we should be focusing our magic on keeping ourselves alive rather than resurrecting ourselves from death. With the plague more rampant than ever, we are fighting a losing battle. Even now, the dead outnumber the living. Man. Possession. Whenever I begin to research a new spell, I always start by attempting to build runes onto established spells. Sometimes an entirely new spell can be discovered by adding a single rune onto a totally unrelated spell. This was the case with possession, the art of casting one's soul into a lower life form. I started by take, taking some basic runes and building onto them. Many of the standard spell bases turned out to be dead ends. I forged through some of my ancient texts without much success, but I did discover an obscure warding, sp warding spell of awesome power. One wouldn't think that a warding spell could be manipulated into a possession spell, but forceful spells are sometimes born from the most unlikely sources. The warding spell has a long history. I don't know if it ever had been used in Obrock. It can only be cast by a group of very powerful Sardin. The spell creates a huge shield that repels any form of magic. I remain uncertain as to its original purpose. The diagram of its rune structure follows. By using this as a base, I experimented by adding variations of runes onto the end. The process was long and tedious, but as it happened, only one rune was needed to fashion an altered, an altered spell. The, di the diagram of the new spell follows. The result was the possession spell. Testing it proved somewhat difficult. There are certain limitations inherent in the magic. 1. One can only cast one soul into a lower life form, such as the, such as the Palkus we use as Beast of Burden. 2. 
One must have physical contact with the target. The soul transfers through the touch, so the spell cannot be cast over distance. 3. While one is, is inhabiting the possessed body, the original body is rendered immobile and helpless. I have some theories regarding the dynamics of the spell. If the original body is for some reason destroyed, the soul should be capable of continued existence in the new body. Eventually, however, that soul for, will forget its previous existence and come to think and behave in accordance with the in inclinations of the possessed body. But even then, the original soul should prove retrievable by the application of certain spells. It might even be possible to reconstruct the original body by using the host body while the soul still exists. Unfortunately, my research has not revealed the spells required to accomplish this, the knowledge of which would have been of great comfort during the test phase of possession. The extent of our lost knowledge is shameful. Sure, sure, surely our ancestors had access to these and, to these and innumerable other magical spells, and I am merely passing over well-trodden ground, if only my own library was more complete. Oh my god. Unrevolution. Another art that has been that has intrigued me for some time is illusion. I have many books on the subject, though none of them detail the entire spell. The use of this magic produces insidious results. The spell speaks directly to the reasoning center of the brain of higher animals such as Sartan, Patron, and even the Mensch races. The spell persuades the brain to accept that something is there when it isn't or that something isn't there when it is. For example, an illusion spell can create a table in the middle of an empty room. Even though the person viewing the table might grasp that the table is an illusion, he will not be able to pass his hand through it, because the spell has convinced his brain otherwise. That's interesting. Possibilities abound for employing the spell, and I regret that all attempts to reproduce it have left me without, with nothing to show for my efforts. However, I've been su somewhat more successful in researching the Unrevel Illusion spell by approaching it from reverse. My reasoning is that I might be able to build the spell by first determining how to break an illusion. At the time of this writing, I have not yet discovered the spell, but I suspect that I am very close. Oh. My. God. The Exodus. I knew that this day would come. Water has become more scarce, scarce each day. The fields of Karen grass are withering, and the lake, our primary water source, is drying up. Soon the lake will be nothing but mud and then little more than rock and dust. The Colossus must be failing. When our ancestors built it, the Colossus was intended to last forever, heating our world, melting the sea of ice above, and distributing the water throughout. Its magic is dying. We must travel back into the core of Abarak, where our ancestors originated, where the remaining magic is strongest. Life will still be possible there, although all I've seen are pictures and descriptions in my texts. I'm sure that if I could examine the Colossus firsthand, I might be able to determine the problem and help to correct it. There is no other choice. We shall sail back to Karen Necros, to the place of Cletus XIV, the current dynast, on the northwestern edge of the Fire Sea. Out of respect, we shall beseech His Majesty for permission, per permission to live in Karen Necros while the Colossus is being repaired. I don't anticipate any resistance. Who would refuse refugees, especially ones eager to help correct the problem? And as I have stated, we have no choice but to go, for life in Telestia, Telestia will shortly become unfeasible. The problem of trans transporting the dead is an extremely challenging one. Many of them removed from their familiar surroundings will grow disoriented. Three at least will find three at least will find it impossible to adapt, so we've decided to leave them behind. The first is my own servant Aramas. He has been with my family for, a lo for as long as I can remember. Although his thoughts are as clear as the best of the dead, he is simply too frail to, o to undertake the journey. I will leave him here while he is comfortable. Where he is comfortable. The second is my nanny. Lately she has fallen victim to a repetitive behavior, that of reading children's stories over and over again. Should the book she loves be taken away from her, she is despondent until it is returned. Not only will she be useless to us wherever we are going, I doubt she could survive the trip to Tact. The last is Jethro. One of the crop workers. He is among the most physically well-developed corpses that we have, that we have, but his brain is like a sieve. Sieve. He waters his crops as if they were still growing, as if there were still water to pour on them. If he is instructed to do something else, he will perform that, perform that task for a few moments, only to wander right back to watering his crops. We can't spare one of the living to supervise him by continually reminding him to accompany us, and we haven't the time to train one of the dead to do it, so it would be best to leave him here. An ending. 
I leave these notes for you to find, reader. The purpose is to shed light on, on who we are and where we have gone, so that you will follow in our path. Do not remain here. Life is impossible. Follow us to the core where we have a fighting chance. Alright. You've learned two spells. You, tr you close the book and replace it in your inventory. The dead butler jerks in motion and shuffles out the double doors, closing them behind him. We better not leave me there. Alright. You exit the study, making certain to leave the doors unlocked in case you wish to return. You stand in the foyer of a small house, stairs lead to another level, and double doors are set in the east wall. Oh, I think we're done here. So let's see where we can go. Celestia, Cletus's palace. Alright. We're going to save again because that took a lot to read. I'm going to check my score. What's my score? Not bad. Five points away from being exactly halfway through. Your ship is docked next to a dark stone palace. Lights in the windows indicate that it is inhabited. You walk purposefully towards the front entrance. The guards there stare at you in wonder, never having expected anyone to willingly walk into the palace. As soon as you approach, one of the guards barks out. Who are you? What are you doing here? You explain that you're trailing the refugees from Telestia. The guard claims he doesn't know what you're talking about, but a knowing look to his companion leads you to believe otherwise. They inform you that all visitors must, must see the dynast. He makes his habit to greet them personally and hold a banquet in their honor. Again, the knowing look that passes between the guards is disquiet disquieting. With a, grim, with a grip that is more insistent than friendly, the first guard escorts you into the palace. You wait for about an hour in a bare room with a single door and no windows. Then the same guard takes you to a large room with a long, long table piled with food and drink. At the head of the table, a man wearing rich robes and a crown of gold sits in a throne-like chair. A broad, welcoming smile on his face. He invites you to sit and partake of this meal, set out in your honor. For lack of a better plan, you sit down. Greetings, my friend. My name is Clytus the Fourteenth. I am Dynast of Abarak, and I rule here. But you probably know that. I am always pleased to receive visitors. I get so very little. Please, tell me how things are in the outer reaches. Hmm. Uh, okay. I have heard some distressing reports about the quality of life in some of the outer reaches, but nothing verifiable. I've been waiting for first-hand information. I'm glad you're here. Are you a refugee? Are there others that require assistance? Uh, I'm alone. So, you don't represent any 